Episode number 137. No. They were all by that time choking the Hall of Examination, where this old man, ugly and wicked, was, and overflowing into the adjacent open space and streets. The Defarges, husband and wife, the Vengeance, and Jack Three, were in the first press, and at no great distance from him in the hall. See cried Madame, pointing with her knife. See the old villain bound with ropes. That was well done to tie a bunch of brass upon his back. Ha, ha. That was well done. Let him eat it now. Madame put her knife under her arm, and clapped her hands as at a play. The people immediately behind Madame Defarge, explaining the cause of her satisfaction to those behind them, and those again explaining to others, and those to others, the neighboring streets resounded with the clapping of hands. Similarly, during two or three hours of brawl, and the winnowing of many bushels of words, Madame Defarge's frequent expressions of impatience were taken up, with marvelous quickness, at a distance. The more readily, because certain men, who had by some wonderful exercise of agility climbed up the external architecture to look in from the windows, knew Madame Defarge well, and acted as a telegraph between her and the crowd outside the building. At length the sun rose so high that it struck a kindly ray as of hope, or protection, directly down upon the old prisoner's head. The favour was too much to bear. In an instant the barrier of dust, and chaff that had stood surprisingly long, went to the winds, and Saint Antoine had got him. It was known directly, to the furthest confines of the crowd. Defarge had but sprung over a railing, and a table, and folded the miserable wretch in a deadly embrace, Madame Defarge had but followed and turned her hand in one of the ropes with which he was tied, the Vengeance and Jack Three were not yet up with them, and the men at the windows had not yet swooped into the hall, like birds of prey from their high perches, when the cry seemed to go up, all over the city, bring him out. Bring him to the lamp. Down, and up, and head foremost on the steps of the building. Now, on his knees. Now, on his feet. Now, on his back. Dragged, and struck at, and stifled by the bunches of brass, and straw that were thrust into his face by hundreds of hands. Torn, bruised, panting, bleeding, yet always entreating, and beseeching for mercy. Now full of vehement agony of action, with a small clear space about him as the people drew one another back that they might see. Now, a log of dead wood drawn through a forest of legs. He was hauled to the nearest street corner, where one of the fatal lamps swung, and their Madame Defarge let him go, as a cat might have done to a mouse, and silently and composedly looked at him while they made ready and while he besought her, the women passionately screeching at him all the time, and the men sternly calling out to have him killed with brass in his mouth. Once, he went aloft, and the rope broke, and they caught him shrieking. Twice, he went aloft, and the rope broke, and they caught him shrieking. Then, the rope was merciful, and held him, and his head was soon upon a pike, with brass enough in the mouth for all Saint Antoine to dance at the sight of. Nor was this the end of the day's bad work, for Saint Antoine so shouted and danced his angry blood up, that it boiled again, on hearing when the day closed in that the son-in-law of the dispatched, another of the people's enemies, and insulters, was coming into Paris under a guard five hundred strong, in cavalry alone. Saint Antoine wrote his crimes on flaring sheets of paper, seized him, would have torn him out of the breast of an army to bear fool on company, set his head and heart on pikes, and carried the three spoils of the day, in wolf procession through the streets.